So conservatives have been going absolutely hysterical about the new Lord of the Rings show on Amazon, The Rings of Power. Now they're crying because there are black elves and black dwarfs. Some other people are crying because it doesn't respect the law and stuff like that. But these grifters never miss a good opportunity to try and whip up outrage against something like this show. And as someone who used to be an absolute like Lord of the Rings fanatic when I was a kid, I even read The Silmarillion as well. And I pretty much probably didn't really understand it as a kid because that book is pretty notoriously hard to read. But I do remember something. So when I hear some of the character names and like Morgoth and stuff like that, I remember reading about that and I'm going to talk about it a bit later, but I actually really liked the first two episodes and I really wasn't expecting much after the initial trailers. And I said in previous videos that I didn't think the trailers looked that good, but I think the show is pretty good to be honest. But there's one thing I'm having a problem with and it's the discourse around Tolkien and Tolkien's work. So of course the right wing are saying that, you know, Lord of the Rings is about European mythology. How dare we have a black character in there? But then there's people on the left saying, well, J.R. Tolkien, he didn't like apartheid. He didn't like the Germans in the 1930s. So therefore he must be some sort of like lib leftist and he'd be totally okay with this. And obviously I'm totally okay with the diverse casting, but the appropriation of Tolkien's work and trying to put him into, I guess, the left category is pretty ridiculous to me. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video because a lot of people are trying to deflect criticism at the show's diversity by trying to put Tolkien on some sort of progressive pedestal. The easier argument to defend it is this guy was born in the late 1800s. He had a lot of racism in his work, adapting it in 2022 and not obeying everything he created, in my opinion, is totally fine. Most films that are adapted from books leave out so many things. My favorite film of all time, got two there, the Blade Runner films, if you read the Blade Runner book or do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, it is very, very different from the film, but the film is really, really good and you understand why it made those decisions. Even the original Lord of Rings trilogy left so much important stuff out and the Hobbit films, bizarrely. But yeah, we're gonna talk about all of that today and also we're gonna talk about the politics of Tolkien and why hard right conservatives absolutely love him. Did you know Tolkien supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War? I bet you didn't because I only found that out today as well. And did you know in Italy in the 1970s there were far-right camps set up based on the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit? We're going to talk about all of that today and of course if you've watched my other videos you're going to hear some things that I spoke about before but I've got different research on them so this is still worth watching. So all of that coming up for you. Please like the video and I guess comment your thoughts on the new Lord of the Rings show. I want to hear what people think because I really enjoyed it but I'll talk about that in a sec. Also check out my social media at the Cabernacle on Twitter, on Instagram. Check out the subreddit down in the description. Also consider becoming a patron. I'm trying to build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible. The benefits of that again access to the Discord server also get my Nintendo Switch friend code and I'm moving to Vietnam on Thursday. I'm not sure when this video specifically will be out, but I'm going to be posting some exclusive content on the Patreon. Nothing amazing, but maybe just talking about what life is like in Vietnam and parts of Asia, stuff like that. So if you're interested, check that out. Also check out my second channel, The Cavernacle Extra, in the description and let's get into the video. So at the time of recording, only two episodes of The Rings of Power are out right now and like I said I didn't have high hopes for this show but upon watching it I actually really enjoyed it I'm pretty invested in it I have my criticisms of maybe the story they're going for but at the same time I can't deny it looks really good for a tv show compare this to Netflix The Witcher and it's like night and day you can really see the budget and I didn't really know if it was going to be like a prequel to the films. Like, were they just going to try and do their own thing? I think it very much is in the movie universe. Like, the shots of the landscape look like New Zealand from the films. A lot of the world looks very similar, but I'm happy to report as someone whose main problem with Lord of Rings as a fantasy world is the very black and white morality, which I really don't like. I feel like this show is taking influences from things like The Witcher, not a TV show, maybe like the books and the games, but also Game of Thrones because it feels a lot more dark and gritty. Although Lord of Rings did often have that in maybe battle scenes, the two towers I'm thinking of specifically there, I feel like the way this is shot has been really interesting. Like that orc scene in the second episode was actually really unsettling. Like I really think that was a great scene and it's something I hadn't really seen in Lord of Rings before in that it made this villain 
and this enemy that has just been so disposable, like killed in the absolute thousand, and there's just one of them, and he's so threatening and so feral, I thought that was really well done. And I'm just enjoying like the politics between the humans and the elves. Of course, a lot of the humans supported Morgoth, so there's still some bitterness there. I'm happy with the direction they're taking Lord of the Rings, but I will say my main criticism is making Sauron the enemy, and he looks just like him in the prologue to Fellowship. I don't really know about that. Even though I didn't like the games, I think the Shadow of Mordor games did actually something quite interesting with Sauron. If Sauron is literally just like this dark villain with no nuance to him and no characterization in this show as well, I think that's a massive missed opportunity and just plays into my biggest criticisms with Lord of the Rings that the morality of good versus evil feels very, very binary and that's just not interesting to me. But yeah, I like it for a fantasy show. Looks amazing. Bear McCreary is doing the score and he did God of War, obviously. My favorite one of his is actually Black Sails. And then Howard Shaw did the title sequence. That's the guy who did the movie score. So I think very much is trying to be like the movie. So yeah, enjoying it a lot. I think if you like Lord of the Rings, you will like this as well. Maybe if you're some sort of Tolkien purist and even someone who has read the books, I can obviously see there are massive differences in the time period they're going for and how this time period is shown in the books. I'm not a purist. I don't care. Make a good TV show based on the Tolkien world. That's enough for me. As someone who's talked about my idea for like this Urukai game set like 300 years after the Return of the King, which would break like all the law. I'm not someone who really cares. And obviously some people even making this stuff don't care. There's sexy Shelob in uh, the Shadow of Mordor games, for example. So you guys know, I would usually cover the backlash to this. Really listen to what people are saying, like the quartering of geeks and gamers. And today I actually don't want to do that because I want to focus on the Tolkien stuff more. But of course you have, look at these thumbnails, nothing racist about them. All these videos from the quartering and geeks and gamers getting quite a sizable view count as well. They're really grifting off this, making so many videos. The weirdest one I saw, they've made Elrond gay. Nothing bigoted about saying Elrond is gay and then putting him in some kink outfit with makeup and lipstick on. But that just shows how ridiculous anti SJWs are. Where is the concrete evidence that Elrond is gay in the first two episodes? Is it because... He doesn't want a romantic relationship with Galadriel and he's friends with Durin. Like, I don't understand where this comes from. But you guys may know CNN has recently gone like full centrist. So it's platforming insane right wingers saying about how the wokeness of diversity is ruining the rings of power. So I just want to read you a couple quotes from this garbage CNN article quick. So Brandon Morse has read... Tolkien's The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and watched the extended editions of Peter Jackson's trilogy, but Morse is dreading a new edition to Middle-earth canon that he said perverts and corrupts Tolkien's mythical medieval universe because TV showrunners have committed this storytelling crime. They are trying to wokeify Amazon's new Lord of the Rings series. Morse is the deputy managing editor of Red State, a conservative news site. He says the Rings of Power producers have cast non-white actors in a story based on European culture and who look wildly different from how Tolkien originally described them. He says it's an attempt to embed social justice politics into Tolkien's world. If you focus on introducing modern political sentiments, such as this leftist obsession with identity issues that only go skin deep, then you're no longer focusing on building a good story. He says without irony, while only focusing on the character's skin color, you're effectively making propaganda or art meant to fit a message, not a message to fit the art. He goes on to say, if someone created a story about a great African kingdom of old, but one of the royals was white, people would naturally find this area out of place. This would especially be an issue if the story was previously established as all characters having black skin. So of course that article is stupid as well. I doubt this guy really knows much about Lord of the Rings in that, yeah, while it was conceived as sort of like this Anglo-Saxon mythology by Tolkien, it takes influences from so much mythology around the world, not just old England. But loads of tweets online that are pretty bigoted and stuff. But as we're gonna show you in the video, there is a reason why so many very conservative people really love the Lord of the Rings. And although there is the grifting backlash of don't put black character in my favorite media property, which is unhinged, I think liberal media has done a poor job at analyzing what attracts these types to the Lord of the Rings. Because I think it can go a bit deeper than something like Star Wars, where people just like the aesthetics a bit more while missing the leftist messaging. 
where Lord of the Rings does not have a left-wing message at all, doesn't even have a liberal message. It's a pretty traditionalist, conservative, Catholic message, which we're going to talk about. And there's one article here, people were kind of calling me out on Twitter because I said it was bad. I don't think the article is bad, talking about like black identity and growing up loving fantasy. I think the article does a poor job at living up to its title, which is a racist backlash to Rings of Power puts Tolkien's legacy into focus. But I don't think this guy really assesses the legacy of the work very well. But it's this bit I have a particular problem with, and we're gonna delve into this a bit more. Tolkien didn't often make a point to describe skin color, though he occasionally leaned on the open-ended Pharaoh Van. Yet there remains the idea that because Tolkien sought to create an English mythology that he intended Middle-earth to be comprised only of white people, this ignores the individuals of colour who have populated England throughout its history and that the first modern Britons had dark skin based on DNA evidence taken from the Cheddar Man, a 10,000 year old skeleton discovered in 1903. So while that is true, I think it's pretty naive to assume that Tolkien taking a lot of influence from Anglo-Saxon history and trying to make Anglo-Saxon mythology based on Germanic peoples in Europe would leave room for diversity, really. Like, I've spoke about this before, how during the Roman occupation, there is clear evidence there was diversity in the British population, people from the Middle East and Africa living in England, but that isn't really the era Tolkien is thinking of. I think this is mainly like liberal projection, trying to give Tolkien the benefit of the doubt well, I don't think you should do. So then this article goes on to say, while there's no sense in speculating on the reactions of a dead man who couldn't possibly fathom the 21st century, Tolkien was notably anti-racist. Again, that is something I wish the article would elaborate on because I don't think it's true. Even for the time period, again, don't think it's true. Biographers have noted that Tolkien was very much opposed to the Aryan ideology popularized in Germany and of the colonialism in South Africa. While there are those, as a number of Twitter accounts have sought to remind me, who believe orcs are intended to be Tolkien's perspective on people of color, there is no evidence from Tolkien's writing or life to justify that. Again, I think this article is very, very poor because he's just saying stuff and the research just isn't there because there is pretty good evidence that Tolkien based his whole world on the European view of race in the 1900s, trying to dismiss this and depict Tolkien as someone who might have been a liberal when he was a guy who supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War is pretty laughable. So this article is not bad for its whole message, but considering its title and considering these passages of the text, my criticism would be a lot of this just isn't true and the author should have done some better research to be honest because I think this article is very lacking and I don't think it really helps as a rebuttal of the criticism of the Rings of Power. Now I did find some really good tweets I wanted to read you of people more in line with me who kind of researched Tolkien's worldview a bit more because these tweets made me laugh but also they are very true and they're the only people I saw really talk about this. So um, Tolkien would be an anti-racist multiculturalist versus Tolkien would have been a racist who would hate seeing POC and media now, man, Tolkien would be a Tory Green Party local council election swing voter. Tolkien would have hated this. Well, yeah, he was a Tweedy pipe smoking Oxford Don born in 1892 and whose passion was translating Anglo Saxon poetry. There's not one single thing happening in 2022 that would leave him both baffled and horrified. Who cares? My point is there's something inherently contradictory in the ways that geek culture leaps to defend Tolkien's legacy, like that article did which we don't do for other authors and ignores that he himself understood how different audiences recontextualize stories. I like that last point about people fighting over Tolkien's legacy because it's something I agree with because liberals and conservatives are both fighting over it while both often ignoring the nuances. So conservatives just like to say it's all about European mythology and somehow this fantasy world has to adhere to, I guess, the norms of 800s England, while of course having so many weird fantasy elements, the fact that having someone with darker skin in it is what breaks their immersion is pretty funny. But also on the other side, liberals trying to take Tolkien's comments about Germany or South Africa and then paint him as some sort of anti-racist, as the article said, is just absolutely laughable. It's just not true. Especially as someone who popularized the fantasy genre, which included his European views on race at the time. Also, this is more of a focus in my other videos. I wanna to touch on it briefly. Obviously, Tolkien's academic work is largely focused on Anglo-Saxonism and Anglo-Saxon history and things like that. And he personally lamented the end of Anglo-Saxon England 
by the Norman invasion. Like, he personally felt aggrieved by that because he felt like it destroyed English culture. That's what he felt about that. This is at the same time where Anglo-Saxon as a racial identity was becoming very popular in America and the UK as well. And although Tolkien didn't write about this, a lot of English people would identify as Anglo-Saxon in this period because the racial identity was so popular. And basically what that did was put Germanic peoples on top of the racist hierarchy. And we spoke about this before. In this period, the Anglo-Saxons said, we're not like the Mediterraneans. We're not like all these other people, the Russians. We don't have any influence from Islam, Arabs, Mongols and stuff like that. We are pure. And the guy who took the Battle of Hastings very personally and set out to write his own mythology about Anglo-Saxon England, you're telling me this guy would somehow be immune to that? Of course he wouldn't. He grew up at the height of the British Empire. He would have these problematic views about race. He wouldn't even be an anti-racist in terms of what an anti-racist would be in the period he lived, let alone today. I don't remember reading about too many anti-racists who um, supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War. So now I want to get on to how Tolkien's views on race influence the Lord of the Rings directly and how even just putting race in fantasy, which is something people are challenging now in modern fantasy, inherently shows how, as an English academic, he was not immune to the racist beliefs of the time he lived in. So just some Guardian articles uh, I've been reading, I think they're pretty good at outlining my problems uh, with the Lord of the Rings on race and just showing you how, yes, Lord of the Rings both has racist influence and is not an anti-racist work by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, Dr. Stephen Shapiro, an expert in cultural studies, race and slavery, accused Tolkien of using the novels to make racial prejudice innocent by presenting bigotry for a fantasy world. The academic claimed, put simply, Tolkien's good guys are white and the bad guys are black, slant-eyed, unattractive, inarticulate, and a psychologically underdeveloped horde. But the Shapiro said that in the trilogy, a small group, the Fellowship, is pitted against the onset of a foreign horde, this reflected long-standing Anglo-European anxieties about being overwhelmed by non-European populations. He said, Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings because he wanted to recreate a mythology for the English that had been destroyed by foreign invasion. He felt organic English culture had been destroyed by the Normans. There is the notion that foreigners destroy culture, and there was also a fantasy that there was a solid homogenous English culture there to begin with, which was not the case because there were Celts and Vikings and a whole host of other groups. Yeah, Tolkien's views about Anglo-Saxon England are really funny, considering the Saxons were migrants and conquerors who only came over in like the four and five hundreds. So another article that came out by John Yatt in 2002, after I think one of the Lord of the Rings movies came out was pretty interesting as well. So um, after I got home from the film, I dug out my copy of the Lord of the Rings and I pulled it straight off the shelf and found there was worse to come. The Two Towers is a story of the battle between Isengard and Rohan. In the good corner, the riders of Rohan, aka the White Skins, yellow is their hair and bright are all their spears. Their leader is very tall. In the evil corner, the orcs of Isengard, a grim, dark band, swart, slant-eyed, and the dark, wild men of the hills. So the good guys are white and the bad guys are black. The genetic determinism drives the plot in the most brutal manner. White men are good, dark men are bad, orcs worst of all. While 10,000 orcs are killed with a kind of Dungeons and Dragons version of biological warfare, the wild men are left standing at the end of the battle and are packed off back to their homes with nothing more than a slap on the wrist. We also get a sneak preview of the army that's going to be representing the forces of darkness in part three. Guess what? Dark faces, black eyes, and long black hair, and gold rings in their ears. Very cruel, wicked men they look. They come from the east and the south. They wield scimitars and ride elephants. Scratch the surface of Tolkien's world, and you'll find a curiously 20th century myth. Begun in the 1930s, published in the 50s, it's shot through the preoccupations and prejudices of its time. This is no clash of noble adversaries like the Iliad, no story of common humanity like the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's a fake forgery, a dodgy copy, strip away the archaic turns of phrase, and you'll find a set of basic assumptions that are frankly unacceptable in 21st century Britain. So touching on this racial angle a bit more, James Mendes Hodds, Orcs, Britons, and the Martial Race Myth Part 1. So uh, from Tolkien's own letters, the orcs are definitely stated to be corruptions of the human form seen in elves and men. They are, were squat, broad, flat nose, sallow skin with wide mouths and slant eyes. In fact, degraded and repulsive versions of uh, two Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. The author saying, cool, that's from his letter 210. 
and he just described me and all my relatives on my mum's side. Why would he say that? We say Tolkien invented orcs as we know them today. More precisely, he synthesised their nature from various traditional characteristics, not of mythical beings, but of real-life humans. Some of those characterizations come from popular European conceptions of the greatest threats to Western civilization. Others come from pseudo-scientific frameworks of racism, some of which Tolkien would have encountered in his academic training. But Tolkien would meet the most germane theory to his orcs in his military service with the British army, the fallacy of the martial race. So orcs are corruptions of OG elves, kind of like how mongoloids and other people of colour are corrupt degenerate versions of the noble white orcozoids whom they resent. Now that description of orcs, which starts his piece, which comes from Tolkien's letter, makes more sense. He writes Mongol types, he straight up tells us he made the Mongol terror and the Mongoloid stereotype into an entire species. Further visual descriptions of orcs throughout Tolkien's letter likes to mention how black, dark or swart-eyed they are. All terms apply to Indians in Tolkien's time, as well as Africans. He also refers to different orc breeds as animals. We've already seen that a description of orcs' violent nature and the British Army's criteria for martial races is identical, but even within the orcish ranks there's another martial sub-race, the Urukai, bred for size and soldiering aptitude. The orcs' masters give us the hierarchy martial race theory, recommends a more thoughtful commander from a higher race, in charge of natural born soldiers from the martial race. Both commanders are the Dark Lords, Melkor and Sauron, the human wizard Saruman the White, and the ex human Ringwraiths. So, to make it a bit clearer in what the author was saying in that article and how it reflects Tolkien's own experience in the military and Tolkien's own views on race, so he's talking about the makeup of the British Empire, where you would have various martial races that would be led by British commanders. So, you would have white men educated at great universities from upper class families being in charge of like thousands of Indian soldiers or soldiers from the pool or soldiers from the other colonies who they viewed as like good soldiers but that's what they were good for as a race of people. They weren't to be the intellectuals, they weren't to be like the academics or anything like that or the politicians or the businessmen they were just good for war. Because to white Europeans, they often felt these people's brains weren't even on the same level as white Europeans. You see this a lot of African Americans, where white Americans have always viewed them as like physical specimens, very good for boxing, very good for sports, of course back in the past, very good for slave labour and stuff like that, but that's what their worth is. It's just the physical, and that's what Tolkien was buying into here, that these races of people were literally bred to fight, but they were led by more human people. Sauron, Saruman, and at the end of the books, all these orcs die, but the men, who are evil as well, just get to go home. So even the construction of race in fantasy is like problematic in itself. It's very clear the depiction of race in Lord of the Rings is very much influenced by the British views on race in the 1900s, and to somehow depict Tolkien as an anti-racist is absolutely ridiculous there's a reason why a lot of people on the right and even the far right as we're going to get into absolutely love his work that goes beyond like big large-scale battles and adventure i was going to talk about the anglo-saxon thing a bit more but i felt like i've covered that enough in previous videos if you're still interested go check them out i made them about four or five months ago but now i want to talk about tolkien's appeal to I guess more far right types and how people find common ground with Tolkien and Evola, which we're gonna talk about in one sec. I just wanted to take one moment in the video to talk about why Tolkien supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Most academics in the UK that he hung around with and he knew supported the Republicans in the Civil War. Even his good friend C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia book, C.S. Lewis was an Anglican and Tolkien was a Catholic, so he took the side of Franco because he believed Franco was protecting the Catholic religion in Spain. So a little article saying, Tolkien's support to the Franco movement rests precisely on his perception of him as the champion of the Catholic Church against the communist menace. Hence, the positioning of Tolkien was a consequence of the close commitment to his Catholic status. Indeed, Catholics fought the insurgents, vindicated the traditional values, and defended the Catholic Church against the dangers of communism and secularism. So just to give some context of how other English Catholics were feeling, in 1939, Archbishop of Westminster, Arthur Hinsley, wrote to Franco, I look upon you as the great defender of the true Spain. 
the country of Catholic principles where Catholic social justice and charity will be applied for the common good under a firm peace-loving government. So Tolkien on communism, his aversion to state control led Tolkien to consider communism as a terrible and harmful approach even during World War II because he described Joseph Stalin as a bloodthirsty old murderer. Moreover, he declared, I am not socialist in any sense, being averse to planning most of all because the planners, when they acquire power, become so bad. So I guess if you get any libs trying to tell you that uh, Tolkien was some sort of leftist or something, just read them some quotes about his stance on like communism or just talk about his support for Franco during the Spanish Civil War. I just thought that was an interesting point to bring up when we're talking about Tolkien's legacy, if we are trying to actually really assess his legacy rather than pretend he was an anti-racist. But now something I want to get into more is that Tolkien in some ways reminds me of Miyazaki, obviously the anime creator, but also Evola in that he is a massive traditionalist. He's very against urbanization and he's very against industrialization. In fact, Lord of the Rings, the book trilogy actually ends with the hobbits coming back to the Shire and under Saruman, men have transformed it into an industrialized place and the hobbits have to fight to reclaim it and bring it back to its old, more rural ways. It's very clearly influenced by Tolkien's own politics it's not very subtle. But more traditionalist views about bringing society back to being rural, of course, don't have to be exclusively right wing, but they often are because a lot of people during this time, they see urbanization, industrialization, who is leading that? Who wants that? A lot of people like Evola, they felt it was Jewish people doing this. So when we think of it in this sense, it's very easy to see how traditionalist Catholics and people who want to go back to a more rural medieval society like Tolkien, and that's the legacy we should be assessing. So now I just want to read to you some quotes Tolkien has about like the countryside and rural life before showing you how people who like Evola can also like Tolkien. So some people talking about Tolkien on the Ask Historian subreddit, and I found these interesting. So um, I think it's important to keep in mind that Tolkien absolutely loved rural England, a lot of the events of the Lord of the Rings can be considered metaphors for the destruction of peaceful rural England being consumed by industrialization, talking about the scouring of the Shire. In fact, of the destruction of rural England, he once said, the country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was 10. In days when motor cars were rare objects, I had never seen one and men were still building suburban railways. Recently, I saw in a paper a picture of the last decrepitude of the once thriving corn mill beside its pool that long ago seemed to me so important. Tolkien lived most of his life in Oxfordshire, the almost perfect stereotype of, of old school England, hedgerows, thatched cottages, mill ponds and water wheels, and he famously rode a bicycle around because he hated cars so much. That's why he reminds me of Miyazaki a lot. And this is just a fun little point that goes into like the themes of this video. Um, initially, he quite liked the attention and would answer all the fan mail he could, but he quickly grew tired of explaining over and over that his books were not pro-communist or anti-capitalist. He eventually had to remove his phone number from the directory because he was so tired of the attention. But when you have someone who believes things like this, especially going back to a more rural agrarian society, it's probably not surprising. You'd automatically have a base for um, more far right types to put their own ideology onto it. So I spoke about Camp Hobbit before, 1970s in Italy, but there's a better article I found for this video just comparing Tolkien and Evola and their influence. So uh, Middle Earth in Italy. The scope of this iteration of Italy's new right was first demonstrated at the Campo Hobbit Festival in June 1977, named after Tolkien's fantasy novel, The Hobbit. The festival drew over 3,000 people and imbued the younger right with a new feeling of strength towards a hostile society. Concrete political objectives were rejected and replaced by abstract values such as courage, heroism, and above all, comradeship. For the festival organizers and attendants, Tolkien's fantasy novels served as a metaphor for their rejection of the modern world and their longing for a future that was better than any historical allegory. They perceived themselves as heroes of Tolkien's imagined Middle Earth, fighting against all odds for the betterment of their contemporary world. As Generoso Simeone, one of the organizers stated, looking to the future, let us evoke from Tolkien's fairy tales those images that enrich our imagination. 
We are inhabitants of the mythical Middle-earth, also struggling with dragons, orcs, and other creatures. To express their attachment to Tolkien's stories, which were deeply rooted in Germanic and Old English legends, the Celtic cross became the new symbol of the youth front. So Julius Avola, who died in 1974, became a guru-like figure for the radical youth, looking for guidance while lost in the mythical lands of Middle-earth. Evola's use of myth mirrored Tolkien's saga of Middle-earth with its eternal fight between good and evil. The similarity between Evola's philosophy and Tolkien's novels, which enjoyed immense mainstream popularity, ultimately increased the appeal of Evola's work among a younger generation of radicals who were in desperate need of a system of cultural references. On the surface, Evola and Tolkien shared another worldview anti-modernism. It is Avola's concept of anti-modernism that they found particularly useful when justifying acts of violence. In his book Revolt Against the Modern World, Evola argues that history was not an evolutionary success story, but a devolution from an imagined spiritual and traditional culture to the modern world. He characterises the Renaissance and the liberal ideas of the French Revolution, and into these post-war economic miracle as false myths, leading the world into chaos. Moreover, he claims that modernity could never gradually transition into what he considered the traditional order. Tolkien's popularity among the right-wing youth who felt marginalised in their own country symbolised a deep dissatisfaction with the modern world that was more rooted in a generational conflict than a specific political ideology. Not for nothing did they try to transcend the traditional left and right divide. Given the many thematic overlaps between Tolkien's novels and Evola's philosophy, it was a small step for some radicals to accept Evola's writings as applicable facts and use them to legitimise their actions. So as that article said briefly, people in this period where even Tolkien was alive and just after his death adopted The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit for different reasons. The British left and American left adopted The Lord of the Rings as some sort of like hippie bible, while the right in Italy basically said Tolkien was showing us a world where people live more traditionally and it's basically saying we should get back to this traditionalist Christian society or spiritual society. People have often argued that the world of Middle Earth created by Tolkien is a bit of a blank canvas for any political group to kind of put their own ideology onto it. And I would say that's a fair point to some degree, but when you actually read about Tolkien's own politics and you read about Tolkien's own philosophy and then read his work, I would argue the Evola reading of it is far more in line with what Tolkien believed than some sort of left-wing communist reading of it. Because if your author of these works is a traditionalist Catholic obsessed with Anglo-Saxon history who hates urbanisation and wants to go back to this more like medieval style of living. I honestly don't think you can read into his work that is like anti-racism. And of course you can also read into his work where his actual racism come into play and his actual experience in the British army and that sort of conditioning come into play in that he depicts certain groups of people very in line to how the British viewed certain groups of people. And that's not to say Tolkien is some sort of like insane racist for his time. By the measure of his time, he definitely wasn't, but he also was just a pretty standard racist because if you grow up in an insanely racist society, it's very, very hard to deconstruct that and not have that affect elements of your writing, especially when you're obsessed with a period of time that so many people are then taking on as their own racial identity. So to conclude, the backlash to Rings of Power having diversity is absolutely ridiculous. As usual, if you watch the show, you're even just like a minor fan of Lord of Rings. I don't even know why you'd have this issue unless you're just a bigger. But then I think articles and works assessing Tolkien's legacy are very, very lacking. And Tolkien is not a figure the left need to claim or pretend he was like us because he was not like us. Even if you can see some of your own political views in his work, that was not his intent. And you can see from what I've shown you in this video and you can go read even more about him that he definitely was not someone sympathetic to socialism, sympathetic to communism, sympathetic to leftism. And there's probably no way in hell if he was alive today that he would actually be okay with the diversity stuff. But the good thing is just like many properties that are started by one person and are adapted by other people or carry on for other people, you don't have to listen to a guy who started writing these books in the 1930s. You do not have to listen to a guy who was born in the 1800s and copy everything he did. Some of the most successful films of all time were The Lord of the Rings. They didn't have a diverse cast. That's been done. You have those films. 
people taking that and changing it up a bit. Who cares? So yes, anti SJW man babies complaining about this are totally ridiculous. If you like the Lord of the Rings films, if you like Tolkien's works, I would say it's pretty likely you'll like the series. But let's not pretend a traditionist Catholic who supported Franco is one of us because he's not and it's not even worth fighting over. So like the video, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.